Hi, I'm going to go through the definition of convergence of a sequence, so also the definition of a sequence. I'm going to prove an example. Uh, the example comes from assignment 2, so I assume most people have already proved it, but I think this is a pretty quick way of doing it. Okay, so let's go. So, we'll start by defining what a sequence is. We're restricting ourselves to essentially infinite sequences, so sequences which map the entirety of the natural numbers to the real numbers, to some su subset of the real numbers. Okay, so from the last video, we know that a sequence is a function. So, uh, a function is a set of ordered pairs of the Cartesian product of two sets. So in the case of a sequence, the two sets are the natural numbers n, try and make this neat, so n cross r. So n is a set of natural numbers. For our course, we're not including zero in the natural numbers, so n is equal to the set 1, 2, etc. Incrementing by 1. <laughs> and R is the set of real numbers. So I'm just going to say, we're just assuming that those are the, the it's the set of values which satisf satisfy the axioms we've studied in the course. Okay. So a sequence is a subset of that Cartesian product because it's a function. So we write f, where f is a sequence, is a subset of n cross r. Now this notation denotes a, a relation, a binary relation. So what we want to do is we want to have a new notation which, which implies that f is a function. So we write f n arrow r. So another name for a function is a mapping. So we can say f maps n into r. Okay. So in the definition of a function, we know that every element of the domain of f must be mapped to some element in r. So we are talking about infinite sequences, essentially. Okay, so let's look, an, look at an example of a sequence. So I'm going to pick the example from the assignment. So f of n equals 2 over n outside of n plus 1. f of n equals 2 over n outside of n plus 1. So intuitively we can see that as n increases, the denominator increases, hence the whole, and, and the numerator remains constant, hence the whole function tends to zero. Because as the denominator increases, the whole function tends to zero. So we've got a good idea that this will tend to zero as n approaches infinity. But we need to have a rigorous definition so that we can prove it for certain. So the definition of convergence uh, uses some logical notation. It uses quantifiers, both the universal and the existential quantifier, and implication. So I'm going to just define quickly what those are so we can think about it more rigorously. So we'll start with implication. So if we have two statements, A and B, we write arrow to say that A implies B. So A is called the, uh, the antecedent and B is called the consequent. So intuitively, I think the easiest way to think about implication is to think about when it fails. So when is the whole statement A implies B false? 
Well, the only time that it is false is if A is true and B is false. Because if A is true and B is false, the implication obviously doesn't hold. So that means that we can rewrite implication using other logical notation. So we can write not A and not B. So negation is simple enough. If B is true, the negation of B is false. This wedge means AND conjunction. So the inside says A and not B. So that is the case when the implication is false. So if we negate the case when the implication is false, we get the case where the implication is true because we're dealing with a binary logic. Okay, so that means A implies B is equivalent to this statement. Cool. The next two concepts are universal quantifier and existential quantifier. So the existential quantifier is essentially a shorthand for for all X. So what we're saying is we're saying that all x satisfy some condition. Now, in general, the set that x is a member of will be the real numbers for this course. So we should just assume that. So we write for all epsilon greater than zero to mean essentially for all epsilon a subset of the real numbers essentially epsilon element R positive, some condition holds. Cool. So the way I like to think about the universal quantifier is as if it was an infinite or any group of conjunctions. So essentially we have say a condition P of X and if for all x, p of x is true, then any conjunction of elements that are within this set, implicitly the real numbers, the conjunction will be true. Okay. So now the existential quantifier. So the existential quantifier is essentially shorthand for there exists some x. So there exists some x. We write reverse E to mean there exists. So this doesn't say anything about the number of elements that satisfy the condition P of X but it just asserts that there is some element which satisfies P of X.